what they call a night for freedom. I believe it was in Washington, D.C. last year, and uh, we went to that. And Mike was so smart that he was able to trick uh, Antifa. <laughs> they told him that we were going to be in one place, and Antifa went over there, and we were in a different location. <laughs> so I want to give you my, my friend, Mike Cernovich. Well, I feel bad after that introduction to sound like the token liberal, but to, to answer the question earlier, is there racism in America? I mean, uh, yeah, definitely, of, of course there is today. A lot of the um, home ownership, home equity, um, blacks were completely shut out of home ownership for a number of years. And, and you can see vestiges of slavery and racism today, of course, but uh, in my line of work, there's two ways that I respond to that. It's either if I'm in a good mood, now what? If I'm in a bad mood, it's so what? Because that's really my work is dealing with people on a one-to-one -one basis and improving their own life. So I would say, of course, I concede that this is, this is true. Okay, but now what? Now what do you do? Is the government going to do it? Um, no, why? Because the government doesn't care about anybody. Nobody got a bailout. In the, uh, the, the 2008 market crash, how many homeowners got bailouts? for that. White, black, Latino, did anybody get bailed out in Compton for that? No, Wall Street got bailed out though. You know, Wall Street got bailed out. And that's why we see the divisiveness of racism. That's why I've said that one thing I, that disappoints me to this day is to see people who are Trump supporters, MAGA, deep state's a problem, look at this bias, FBI's a problem. I'm like, okay, so maybe Black Lives Matter has a point. Can you make room for the possibility then that the federal criminal justice infrastructure isn't perfect? But now, of course, the left, which sides with Black Lives Matter, is and saying it's infallible, and they're wishing people go to prison every day, right? Like, oh, Manafort's in jail. They're, like, happy about it. They want Michael Cohen to go to jail. It's like they're happy about it. There's this, like, bloodlust now that's completely overtaken the nation and that's why, of course, the left and all these other big outlets, they want to play up the racism. So that's what has always sort of disappointed me in this time we're in, is it is an opportunity for populists on both sides of the aisle. So people go, what are your politics? And well, I'm not conservative, because what are they conserved? Oh, but they support limited government. Oh, unless we're taxing people money to give government contracts to Raytheon and Boeing to bomb the Middle East. Well, but, well, we support limited government. We oppose welfare. Well, um, corporate welfare is okay with conservatives. Big government is okay with conservatives if we're going to war with some other country, right? And then, of course, the left now, they really care about children in cages, except whenever Trump bombs Syria, and children die, suddenly we don't care about the children anymore, right? So when you look around, <coughs> you see, I mean, you see like we're, we're missing an opportunity. An opportunity, or what I've called the energy shift, which preceded Kanye, we're missing this like opportunity for unity right now. And you can feel people fighting it. The idea that we all know that, that neither the Democrats or Republicans care about the average man or woman, but I mean, especially about the average man, they don't care about it. Male suicide, four times the rate of female suicide. How many people here know that 84% of suicides are by men? You know, a few people here, most people don't know. You tell them that, they don't believe it, actually. I live, in a, I live in a world where people call me a liar when I just drop a statistic. I go, well, did you know, actually, men commit suicide at four times the rate of women? Well, it can't be true. Well, let's, you know, let's look it up. So they don't care about suicide unless it's Anthony Bourdain. And then, of course, if they love suicide, then retweet suicide hotline number. Get them retweets. Within the very next day, they're saying, oh, we dug up some random person's internet history, and we're going to like publicly shame that person and try to destroy that person. Oh, so what if that person kills himself? Well, that's not my fault as a journalist. If as a journalist, I uncover the truth and I share the truth, I'm free from consequences. So Huffington Post went after a Jewish woman who she tweeted a lot of things I didn't like. Well, I, you know, I wasn't aware of it, and I was like, eh, you know, you can criticize Islam without having a meme of a pig with a 
Muslim person on a spin, you know? There's better ways to go about it. But do you call the person's job? Do you call her husband's job? Do you know about the wife? Which to me I thought was ironic is, you call the husband's employer to ask about the wife who's Islamophobic, but expecting the husband to be able to control his wife's Twitter account sounds like Sherry a lot to me, right? It's like they're missing, you know, they're missing the punchline there. So, so everywhere you look, you, you see it. It's ultimately elitism and tastemakers versus like the regular people. And the regular people are, are letting this divisiveness, you know, come into play because yes, there is, there is racism. Well, you know, now what, so what? Well, fundamentally, you just have to take leadership. So the earlier conversation was, you know, what is a man? And I've thought about this issue a lot within the context of TV. If I went to Comedy Central or, I don't know, some network, and I go, you know, I have this idea. I'm going to have women jump up on a trampoline with big boobs in the air. <laughs> We're going to talk about craft beer and IPAs and bacon. And we're called the man show. Fuck yeah, man, that's manliness, right? The man show. But then what if I go, you know, I have this idea for a, for a program. Um, we're just going to have men call in and talk to each other and give each other advice and say, if you want to get married, get married. If you don't want to get married, don't get married. If you want to get married when you're young, get married when you're young. If you don't, don't. Live life on your terms. Do what you want to do. Live as you like. That show's never going to get approved. Right? Right? Never. That, you'll never see anything like that on television, where you talk about real, actual men's issues. But if you want to have a caricature of masculinity, what I call bacon and boobies masculinity, they'll allow that. Right? So now when you think of what is like masculinity in America, craft beer, right? No, it's like a male hobby. You can have that as a man. You can go, you know, get your hops and, you know, talk about how good the beer is and everything. They'll let you do that. Um, they like talk about bacon, you know, just eating meat somehow is masculine. I'll never figure that one out. I'm not vegan, but I just, like every time I post about veganism, people are like, bacon, manly. Uh, not really. I, I don't really see what that is. So then when you say, what is being a man, or at least what is a, being a man to me, or anyone, I would just say fundamentally it's about some kind of life purpose, some kind of force of will getting up, making it happen every day. And when you look around, that's lacking everywhere. Especially, I see people like under 30, and I'm thinking, God, what a great life this guy has, you know? I'll see these kids, and they're just doing nothing with their lives, playing video games or whining about feminism, which of course is not healthy either, right? So, you know, racism is real, yes. Okay, is sitting around talking about racism all day gonna do anything for you on a micro level? No, feminism is a problem. Yes. Nobody gives a F-U-C-K about men. True. If you try to help men, you're going to be called a creepy men's rights activist and attack. True. Okay, but on the micro level, what is that going to accomplish for your life to focus on, to focus on problems? And we see that uh, everywhere. Everywhere we look, everything now is a focus on problems. You're a liberal and you just focus on how bad Trump is. Okay, fine. I, I happen to like Trump a lot, but if you say you're liberal and you don't like Trump, and I say, fine, what's your solution, right? We're really sad about these 2,000 children being held in, you know, dormitories. Okay, cool, what's your solution? Do you have to have open borders or, you know, because the parents are being stopped at the border? What's your, well, they don't have one. And that is fundamentally a failure of a collective masculinity. The idea of being a man in a workshop, tinkering away, trying to figure things out having some kind of vision, some kind of dream to work forward every day, that's lost culturally. What, what, what do we do, and I don't want to, you know, stereotype too much, we bitch all day. Feminists, racists, uh, Trump and his Nazi supporters, and the liberals, and the, right? We, we do all day. We sit around. I, I read it, you know, because I, I monitor all this stuff, and I read it. That's 90% of, of what I read all day. How many people are making things happen? How many people are building? How many people are creating their own infrastructure? Creating their own um, news-making enterprises? Conservatives go, oh my God, there's bias in the media, liberal media. Yeah, you're right, there is. What are you doing though? Well, you're complaining about the bias in the media. Doesn't sound very, you know, doesn't sound very masculine to me to 
sit around and cry and complain all day. But we've, but we've lost it as a culture. We've lost it on a macro level. We've lost that on the micro level. So whenever I come to an event like this, I just always think in those terms are, well, you know, what are people working on? What are their solutions? What are they doing every day to build a better life? And when you think about the many problems in our culture and our country, the answer to that is always going to be, of course, so what? And it's always going to be now what? And that's it for speeches, because I don't like to give speeches. I like to do Q&A. So anybody who has a question or questions, let's hear them. Yes, sir. My question would be for someone who wants to start out in some sort of a news presenting situation, you know, whether it's a YouTube channel or men on the street, how would you go about it? Because whenever I try to think about it, I get um, c not confused, but tangled up in the, in the weeds of it. And, you know, what equipment do I get? Where do I get it from? All this stuff. So, Yeah, two issues. One is Flacus is here. He has a great YouTube personality. So there's Flacus. You should talk to him earlier. He can answer that better than I would. Um, two is, know who's in the room. How do I know who he is? Because I pay attention all the time. Uh, three is, you, you said you're thinking all because you're, you're thinking too much. You're not acting enough. So fundamentally, what stops people from changing their life? Well, I'm going to look stupid. People are going to judge me. I'm going to suck. Yes, you're going to look stupid. People are going to judge you. And you're going to suck. OK. And in 10 years, if you don't do something today, in 10 years, you're going to suck. Or not. Right? Because time's going to move on with or without you. So you can say, well, I'm I'm dumb, and people are going to make fun of me. I mean, to, to be honest, actually, when you post your first videos, you would, you would love to get the hate that I get because people are actually paying attention. So your biggest problem is going to be obscurity. Nobody's going to pay attention. You're going to feel like you're keeping a diary, but you grind away every day. And then other than that mindset shift, the next one is this is the most important. It's just the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of your results in life are going to come from 20% of your actions. Do a video every day. Eventually, do I have a video every day for one, two, three years? Go watch the first Joe Rogan podcast. It's like the dumbest thing you'll ever see. It, no, it, re it really is terrible. Um, they're sitting in a Mac screen. There's some kind of like snowflake things floating up in the background. I encourage you, go, go watch it, and then go watch Joe Rogan podcast today and see if there's a little bit of a difference, right? So what if you know, Rogan and Red Bandit just said, well, I mean, we'll know how to do a podcast, right? They wouldn't have anything. So that's the idea. Is what, whatever you're comparing yourself to, you're not comparing yourself to where people started off five years ago. You're comparing yourself to where they are today. And if you do that in any area of your life, going to the gym, uh, writing, uh, traffic, personality, anything, you're always going to fail. So don't compare yourself to where they are today. Compare yourself to where they were when they started off, and then you'll have a more realistic expectation. <coughs> you mentioned um the existence of racism, blacks being shut out by the, the banking industry, but um, um, how would you quantify that in the sense of blacks not being lent money by black-owned banks, and Asian having a higher um, probability of getting a mortgage from banks versus white? Is that racism, or is there some other anomaly that explains that? Sure, the, the counter argument to what I've said is that, well, you know, first generation Asian immigrants come in and they strive and they succeed. So why is it that blacks maybe aren't at the level of Asians? Uh, well, the war on drugs is one explanation. The, um, I mean, we get to watch now the whites fall, right? So everybody who thought, oh, the blacks were just inherently flawed is great. Now we've got the opiate epidemic for whites and we have the illegitimacy rates. And we have all the great problems that have happened in the inner city since the 70s. So now we get to have all those two in, in the white community. So crack cocaine and co uh, crack rock versus powder cocaine disparity, big problem. Reefer madness, the idea that you know if you uh, black people were you know black men especially were you know smoking marijuana, they're going to run around raping people. So the war on drugs went in, decimated the communities, destroyed family, destroyed fathers. So now there's all these these issues going on there that also tie into. The, um, you know, the ability to, to strive, get a mortgage, have some kind of responsibility, not being raised by a father. I mean, you can't say this, obviously, but there are, um, if you look at single motherhood rates versus, you know, nuclear family rates, there's just statistics say what they say. 
So you, you have a lot of these issues, but a lot of those have to do with, again, the war on drugs, which was a um, you know, major problem. But, but that still doesn't explain black banks not lending um, mortgage, black mortgage, um, you know, people who want mortgages. You know, is that racism? Oh, sure, blacks can be racist against other blacks. But that, is there something else to that? Is it that credits are shot? Well, uh, the credit rates are going to be low, sure. I mean, there's all these issues. The question is what caused them, how do you fix them? And one of, the, and that's why focusing all the time on what caused them doesn't actually bring anybody <coughs> forward, right? If, if I would say, if you said what was, you know, the, the biggest problems in the black community, I would say, well, probably the war on drugs was the biggest one that just went through and <laughs> took a bunch of fathers away from their children. Why? For doing the same thing as everybody else was doing. Guess what? Everybody does drugs. And so they went in two, three decades ago, went in, swooped away a bunch of fathers, arrested them under the war on drugs, and, and now you know, you're dealing with those ramifications decades later. But why is it posited that it is the white, it, it always presented as if it's the whites that's preventing that. Why is it not their responsibilities? Um, if the black banks aren't lending, blacks, you know, why is it always being posited that it's the white man's um, fault? Or if Asians are getting more loans than blacks and whites, why are, uh, why are they being blamed? Why are whites being blamed? Uh, oh, because it's easy. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you want to be in terms of, you know, because it's just easy, easy narrative. So people, like I said, you know, earlier is people don't want to actually find solutions. People just want to find somebody to blame for whatever the problem is and say, well, it's your fault and we're going to fight about it. And who's the biggest of fault? Why? Well, because there's a lot of money in that. But why, why don't we um, address it in, in, in economics and education versus racial? Uh, why, I don't know. You're, because why don't we? economics. Is it, to me, it's economics at work. I mean, if I ruled the world, imagine that. That's what we, that's what we would do. <laughs> I, I guess my question is, you mentioned the word elitism. Where, where's the elitism in somebody saying, I'm proud of you, why? Well, my personal experience with this, and I've been down this rabbit hole, is on an intellectual level, you would say, well, why is it that that's wrong for people to say? Well, because I've met those guys, and, you know, they're not good people. So, they're... Um, yeah, on an intellectual level, you would say, well, I mean, everybody can be proud of, you know, various things. And that makes a lot of sense. But when you go down that rabbit hole, you really just do see a lot of nastiness that, like, the people always say, you don't talk about Jewish people enough. And I said, because that's all you want to talk about. You talk about that one time. And those people every day are going to come back, talk about this more, talk about this more. And they're like, they're like head cases. So if I'd be like, you know... He's really upset I bought this. Microphone, it doesn't work right if you lie to. And they'll go, well, you know who really lies the most, right? That's what they do every time. They're, they're just insane people. So it isn't on its face necessarily the hugest problem in the world. But if you actually deal with those people, as I have in intricate detail, uh, they're, they're not the kind of people you want to be around. I was curious that... Uh before he died, Andrew Breitbart really had a knack to teach people to not, people in, in, in the news, to not run with the narrative, to take the narrative away. Because it, it seems like everywhere I look in the mornings, it seems like the left puts out, a, puts out some verbiage that gets repeated over and over again, and then everybody falls victim to taking and picking it up. He had the best knack of taking it away and... and just owning it, owning it differently. Any, any comment about that? Well, yeah, the, whoever dictates the news cycle dictates reality. And during the election, I mean, I, you know, me and a few other people, we control the narrative every day. We, we made, I mean, you can, you can fact check this actually, that, that we made Hillary Clinton take away her stool that she would lean on. I kid you not. Google Hillary's stool. So somebody brought up the attention, uh, brought it out that every time Hillary gave an event, there was a stool buyer, and she would kind of lean on it, and, and you know, it was just kind of this thing that the mainstream media would never cover. So we created an entire has hashtag, Hillary stool, is she weak, she lacks fortitude, we really did. And then the next time she showed up, it was gone. So we did it, and um, the question is, why don't more people get it? Um, because conservatives fundamentally want to be liked and accepted by the, the liberal media. Kevin I mean, Williamson you, wanted to work for the Atlantic. Nobody in the Atlantic wants to work for the National Review. That sort of you know, one example sets the tone for the entire um, landscape. 
The, the, the example I would use for it that I heard recently was that the president could pardon himself and everybody ran with it. The president hasn't been, hasn't been accused of anything. Uh, you know, he hasn't, you know, hasn't been indicted in anything. And the fact that, that the press, everybody would, would take that suggestion that he could pardon makes it, makes it seem like he's already done something wrong and now he can pardon himself. You follow what I'm saying? Is that well, he said that, though. He tweeted out he could do it. So Trump dictate, dictates a lot of the, the narratives of the day. But yeah, you're right. Everybody is talking about the 2,000 children in you know, concentration camps that MSNBC is calling it, right? Why? Because they, the left is better at this than the right is, without, without question. Why? Uh, you know, that can be debated time and time again. I think the, I don't know psychologically why this is, but people who are conservatives don't want to do journalism. They want to be commentators. They want to, you know, critique. So if you're critiquing, then whoever sets the agenda for the day, now you're saying, well, it isn't really, two you've already lost. Well, it isn't really 2,000 students. Well, you've already lost, right? Well, it isn't a concentration campus, a detention center. Okay, you've already lost, right? But that's uh, philosophically where mainstream conservatism is. They want, to, they want to critique and commentate. They don't want to drive the news cycle. So the, what they should be doing is... Rather than talk about what they want to talk about, just come up with something much more compelling to talk about. Or talk about it in a different way. Or, you know, use that attention to bring attention to something else. So there's a lot of different, and I've written about it and talked about it, but it, it takes a tremendous amount of moral courage every day just to get smashed. I mean, if you, if you go Google me, the first thing it says, alt-right social media personality. Alt-right. You know, it doesn't matter. They just lie. They just fabricate um, things about you. So how many people want to deal with that? Well, if you go face down the, the left-wing media, you're going to deal with that every time. Character assassination everywhere you look. The SPLC will add you to a list where they target people for assassination. And there has been a mass shooting actually by the SPLC. So how many people actually want to go you know, face that down? That, you know, not many. So that's why, probably why Breitbart had a heart attack. It's just he was at it you know, every day all the time. And you can only do that for so long. I follow your content, like I follow Fleck is, I follow a ton of people all the time, but for a person that isn't in that world, like I could watch all you guys' stuff for like eight hours and feel like I accomplished something, but then I think at the end of the day, I'm like, and they're doing what they love to do, but I'm just sitting here taking it in, like how, what would you suggest for a person that's not in that world that I will be putting up with that and I don't have anything to do, like how much time should I really devote to that versus just getting away from all that stuff and doing what I want to do? Zero. Um, zero time. Uh, I, I've actually said this before where the only reason I'm good at what I do is I never did any of that when I was in my 20s. Not, never, never knew what social media was. When uh, friends of mine were on Twitter, I was like, Twitter, this is the dumbest thing I'd ever heard of, right? Why would anybody be on Twitter? I had no idea. So yeah, I, I always tell people I, I feel like almost like ethically conflicted. Fundamentally, people have to take responsibility for their own lives. But I produce all this great stuff for people. But I'm like, go to the gym, read books, you know, make it happen, focus on a craft, find, you know, some kind of thing. And then, you know, at the end of the night, then go, you know, wind down or, you know, watch things. So, yeah, I, I even wrote like a kind of clickbaity, but not really, but like confess, confessions of a dopamine dealer, right? I'm like one of the biggest drug dealers on the planet in terms of dopamine, giving people that rush. Let's get outraged by this. Let's look at this. Let's look at that. Meanwhile, knowing that this probably isn't healthy for anybody, the, the focus needs to be, when you're, especially when you're a younger man like you are, just killing the game, you know, becoming a success, you know, figuring out how to, to do things in life. And you know, come back in a year. Come back in a year to all this stuff. It'll, it'll still be here. What are your biggest goals as Mike Cernovich? To actually, to, to get out of all this stuff. Um, <laughs> People are always like, your 50 minutes are over. I'm like, I'm trying to make them over, you know? Yeah, they're, um, I feel like I did, I, I, I did, but I, I, first of all, I never set out to do any of this stuff. It was just, I got in it, was having fun, but my life was, was so much better just on an individual level before I ever got into this stuff. I mean, you know, just, here's the kind of stuff I deal with every day. The, um, I did an okay sign at the White House, right? Everybody knows this okay sign. And you know, we mimic Trump because when he talks a lot, he'll do it. 
Well, my wife's mom gets a message from her, I don't know, either brother, or, you know, some close relative that said, did you know your daughter's married to a white supremacist? She's like, what, you mean Michael? You know, these are Persian people. Like, what do you mean? Like, we're that, well, he's doing a white power thing, right? This is just the kind of stuff you deal with every day if you're wearing them. So people, when they see it, they see the glamorized version of it. Like, oh, I, what's it like? He's got all this influence and all this and that. It's a tremendous downside. And the downsides outweigh the upsides by two or three, two or three to one. Do you, do you have any like higher purpose or, or goal that you want to see happen in society with this work, or is it just all about the rush of breaking stories and, and steering narrative? No, I mean, fundamentally, America's done 20, probably 2024, and I'm just saving as many people as I can, waking up as many people as I can. You know, hey, come over here, here's the truth. If you want to sit around all day, oh, we're, we're going to get Hillary Clinton, she's going to jail. No, okay, I can't save you. You're gonna have to go over there. Nothing's ever gonna happen to her. Why live in plutocracy? What's the plutocracy? It's governed by the elite, the rich. Go look at the Bale Street, Battles of Wall Street. So, all the people who wanna like get real woke, come on over here, and we're, we're gonna have to do something. Cause I'm not, you know, I'm not going anywhere. I have a family. I'm gonna live in a world. I wanna live in a world that's good. I wanna impose my. Uh, aesthetic sen uh, sense under the world and sensibilities under the world. So I do want to build a better world. Whether that better world is in America or whether a bunch of people are going to have to like peace out. Um, this was interesting when you said it, but how can the same race be racist to each other? Racist, racism is just judging people by their, by their race. So you can have inter or intra race. Now, if you look at the sociological definition they would now even say that actually blacks can't be racist against anybody, even whites, because you have to have structural power, they call it. So it's prejudice plus structural power, and structural power would be defined as like the white male patriarchy or something like that. So just, but in terms of literal sense, if you're treating people differently based on their racial background, and especially in a negative way, that would be racism. Uh, you mentioned that you think that some are too obsessed, perhaps, with the Jewish question, but how valid do you think the alt-right's criticism of Jews actually is? Well, they're, they're critis first of all, the one is, when people use the Jewish question, I always think, do people know where that comes from? You know, it's a Nazi propaganda line. So one, well, you know, so one is, if people do want to have a conversation about issues, appropriating language from Nazi Germany probably isn't the best way to to go about it. Uh, I think that the question was, uh, is a bit older than that. Doesn't it refer to like whether or not Jews should solve their issues by either immigrating to Israel, going through with international communism, or those were like the two routes, those were the two options that they felt that they had. So it's not just, that question isn't just from Nazi Germany. It's, it's language that was definitely used as Nazi propaganda. Which, again, is a, is, it, well, this is what I always liked about the alt-right guys. When they did their um, salute, they go, well, it's not a Nazi salute, it's actually a Roman salute. I'm like, who's the cuck now, right? Just own it. Just own it, right? Just say it's a Nazi salute, not a Roman salute. Um, the, question, the question is, should it be fair game to talk about any kind of representation of any kind of group in any kind of industry? And the answer is, people have those conversations all the time. But the issue is that the people who fixate on that issue are not the kind of people you want to be around. So in that regard, they're their own worst enemy. It's like, why does anybody want to talk about it? Well, because that's, that's all, the same thing with race and crime, right? When, like when a white guy raises his hand, let's talk about ra race, race and crime. It's like, well, I'm not afraid to talk about it, but that's all you're ever going to talk about every time I see you. So it, it becomes this weird, morbid fixation. So. If, if people wonder why more people don't want to have controversial conversations, is because it, it, global warming is the same way. Um, people go, why don't you ever talk about, you know, why man-made global warming is actually true? And I go, because oh, that's all those people want to talk about. Like, uh, again, I could, I could say, boy, it sure is, you know, warm in here. They'd be like, well, if you're saying global warming is real, I'm here to tell you it's not. It's like, no, I'm just, I'm just having like a casual conversation. So th those, those topics tend to lend themselves to monomania. And monomania attracts just a, a really, really odd group of people. 
Uh, how do you conclude that uh, South America is pretty much done by 2024? Have you seen the Skid Row in California? You know, as America goes, America in 2024 will be great if you're the one percent of the one percent. We'll have a we're going to have a nice Brazilian. A model in America. So if you're very rich, you'll be able to, to hire all kinds of people to cater to like every woman you have. But if you're just like a, a normal middle class working person, you're going to be pushed further and further and further down. If you look at wages, actually, everybody goes GDP is up. Well, GDP, you want to talk about a big lie. GDP is a big lie. Because if all of the gains go to the very top and none go to the bottom, GDP is up. Oh, wow, GDP is 4%. Okay, what's happened to median wages? So that's again, why I'm a populist, not a conservative, not a liberal, is I'm more concerned with, rather than gross domestic product, what is the, the median life? Can you afford to have a family with just one person working a job? How many people can do that? Right, so why don't we redefine the measures of economic success and prosperity, but rather than do that, we're focusing on, oh, you know, look, there's all these tech, tech billionaires. Well, great, we have record number of, you know, druggies in the streets now, too. So California is showing the way because we love to brag about the prosperity in California, but we don't like to, we like to pretend, you know, that we have basically no-go zones practically due to drugs and needles and San Francisco a woman in Noe Valley got hit over the head with a hammer. That's a nice area, San Francisco. So even if you're walking in a so-called nice area, you might you might get smashed in the head. So we're going to get more of that because that's liberal liberal tolerance taken too far. You know, I, I I believe in tolerating people, but if you have complete and total tolerance for anything, then that's what you get. So the California model is sweeping um, America now because people leave California because far left-wing policies are destroying, this, destroying it. So we have a now net migration, and now they're going to turn Texas blue. They're going to turn Colorado blue. Uh, the hurricane in Puerto Rico is going to turn Florida probably blue now, right? So if you, if you just watch that map go and you watch the median wages and you, you, know, you look at that data, it's for just the working man, the working woman, the middle class person, it's not going to be a very nice place in 2024. Hello, Mike. That leads directly into my question. Uh, my question was, what three trends you see developing in California slash United States between now and 2024? And what three trends would you like to see if what you are seeing is not what you're liking? Um, the big trends are actually the, um, the decimation that we've seen and you know, the inner cities are going to the, the white world now too. So the, you know, the white life expectancy actually went down for the first time in you know, forever. So white life expectancy is actually down. Everybody else's life expectancy is going up. So the, the big trends are gonna be working class, sort of rural, uh, that's gonna be one of them. The, 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 the sort of working class, rural, white community and what's going on there. Opiate epidemic, of course, is happening. The, the, the failure of medium wages to increase is like another big trend to look at. And you're going to see a lot more, um, more of a need to replace people. That, that's why we have, um, people say we need immigration because our own natural birth rate has gone too. So we're gonna see more of the, the natural birth rate of uh, native born Americans continue to decline. What would you like to see? Uh, I would like to see economic prosperity be measured by affordable family formation and the, you know, the ability for you to feasibly raise a uh, nuclear family with one person working or maybe one person working full time, the other person working part time. I think that's how we should measure economic success and that's how I personally would measure um, economic success. You're saying that in 2024 it's going to be looking pretty bad. Uh, shoot, I think so too. And uh, what advice would you give to a 16-year-old kid who lives at a home with a Hispanic uh, background where uh, they kind of like uh, came to the U.S. for a better life, but they like uh, say, they, they just leave, they, they leave uh, like uh, the schooling to raise you instead of them. What advice would you give that kid who's already kind of brainwashed already kind of like dumbed down at the point of 16 and, and also like a zombie to the phones and like to the media, you know, like what, what, could, what advice would you give that kid? Because right now, it's just like going downhill, you know? Yeah, that, actually I did a um, kind of a periscope on that when I was stuck in traffic here. 
which was I was on Amazon one day and the three best-selling books in all of Amazon, How to Win Friends and Influence People, uh, 12 Rules for Life, and then The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. And I just thought, like, that says it all. You're, you're being raised by wolves, you know? If you don't pick up a book and really take initiative for your life, you're fucked. Like, there's no other way to put it. If you let this degenerate, debased, victim, disgusting, petty, vile culture raise you, you're fucked. You got no shot. That's just the reality. But the flip side to that is there's never been more opportunities to get woke, anything you want to learn. You want to learn physics, you can go watch a free thing on YouTube. You want to learn about life, you can go watch that on YouTube. You want to learn how to get in shape, there's like 10,000 fitness channels with, with exercise channels. But yeah, you're, you're absolutely 100% right. If there's only one characteristic I can instill in all people, uh, especially younger people, and especially men, would be you're fucked if you don't figure it out on your own. Just accept it, own it, quit worrying about how the cards are stacked against you. You're fucked, nobody's going to save you. But there's a whole world out there if you figure it out. And it'd be the best life. There's never been a time in your life where you could just be some regular guy and, and live the kind of life that you can live if you really apply yourself. So if you're, and, but that goes to the 2024 hypothesis, which is if there's, ne there's never been more opportunity for you to like rise up. If you just think you're going to show up, you get a good job, life is going to happen, you're going to be at the bottom, you're not going to be in the middle. If all you do is show up, but if you really take action, take charge, take initiative, then you're going to live a life that nobody ever could have li lived unless born into royalty. And even then it'll be better. Do you, and, you know, we want to address actual issues and not have to deal with this. Do you see any strategies for like pushing back on that? Because, you know, it affects like oh, I'm not sure I should talk to this guy because I might get called alt-right or whatever. Yeah, accuse me of something. Just say something. Mean. Say something nasty to me. Pretend you're a journalist. You're not. Oh, yeah, where, where's, your, where's, your, where's your segment asking Barack Obama about meeting Louis Farrakhan? Have you talked to Keith Ellison? Where can I find that segment? Show it to me right now. Let me see. I saw the picture. Where is it? Right? That's how you mess up bullshit. <laughs> do, you see any, do you see any legal channels for pushing back, or is it just something that very like wealthy, established people can do? Like no, no, there's no, you can't sue for defamation. You can't. Okay. Thank you. So you have to have that everything they ask you. Well, you said this. Okay. Have you ever asked uh, Bill Clinton about we need a Broderick? We're not here to talk about. Well, you want to judge me? Let's have a conversation. You think you're a tough guy? Why don't you go ask Bill Clinton this? Right? Just look them in the eye. You think you're a tough guy. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about real issues. Right? They got nothing for you. So you don't ever defend yourself. You don't defend yourself. You don't deny. You reframe. Oh, you want to be tough? You want to ask me about tweets? Yeah, let's talk about that. Let's talk about Bill Clinton. Oh, you don't want to talk about that because he's got real power. You, you, you don't want to lose that access. Oh, sure, let's talk about, let's talk about Keith Ellison. Let's talk, let's talk about that, right? They got nothing for you. They freeze up. They freak out. That's, how, that's why I don't get invited on the big shows. Because they know that they're gutless hypocrites. But we need more people to do what I'm willing to do, which is to say, fuck you. You're not running shit. Right? This ain't an interrogation. You're not an FBI agent. I don't have to be here. You're not running shit. And you have to have that as your mindset. And that's how I have as my mindset anytime somebody tries to check me on some bullshit. It's just, you're not running shit. Who told you you're running shit?